All right, so this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 5, Imperial Reforms and Colonial Protests, 1763 to 1774. This will be Section 1, Confronting the National Debt, the Aftermath of the French and Indian War. So that's a very important point to start at. Now recall, the French and Indian War was fought between Britain versus France. And in that war, the British were victorious. This saying here, rule Britannia, was really a celebration of British victory in that war. So that was a very important point. However, despite the British being victorious, they were left with this huge national debt. And that's really where uh, kind of chapter five gets the ball rolling, what to do about this national debt. Uh, this war is also referred to as the Seven Years' War. So the Seven Years' War is the, the, same, the same war as the French and Indian War. Uh, the French and Indian War was what they called it in the colonies because the English were fighting against the French and the Indians. This war was fought elsewhere, including Europe, the Caribbean, and India. They called the larger conflict the Seven Years' War. So they're essentially the same thing. So hopefully that doesn't confuse you. Uh, you also get introduced to a term here that's going to be very important to understand moving forward. That is the term loyalist. A loyalist is a person, as you might imagine, loyal uh, to Great Britain, right? So a loyalist is a person who is loyal to Great Britain during the events which unfold leading up and through the American Revolution. So loyalists are those who are, again, loyal to Great Britain. Now, one of the major consequences of the Seven Years' War was that New France, all of that territory that the French had originally claimed, now belonged to the English. So if we look at this map here, uh, essentially all this territory right here that you see in the blue now is British territory. And many of the colonists, English colonists, were very excited about the prospect of being able to settle that territory. And so that's what they did. Uh, this point here, colonial westward movement, is going to lead to a new set of consequences for Native Americans in that particular region. Uh, before we get to that, though, this British territory was protected by 10,000 troops. We're going to call them Redcoats. Now, when we think about the troops that were left over from the Seven Years' War, the British left them there to protect territory. However, the colonists became suspicious. Uh, and excuse my sloppy handwriting there, became suspicious of those troops. Were they out there for some other reason? So there's a sense of anxiety perhaps growing among some colonists about these leftover troops from the Seven Years' War. Um, but what were the consequences for Native Americans? Recall France is gone. And with France, you had, and we had mentioned this a couple times before, what might be the best European ally. You know, the French had built the strongest and longest lasting relations with the Native American population, more so than Spain or England or the Dutch. And so with France out of the picture, now Native Americans are more or less forced to deal with the British. And the British are not just after uh, furs, right? Remember, the French were primarily interested in the fur trade. Uh, the English want land. And the fact that this territory now belongs to England means that you have tons of colonists who begin pouring over this uh, area here, seeking land, not simply just seeking trade, and this is gonna cause problems. Uh, it leads to violence, and I think all of these sort of points right here sort of uh, describe that, right? You know, so this colonial shift or this colonial migration leads to increased violence. So let's just talk about a couple of these instances here real quick. Uh, Pontiac, Pontiac is a Native American leader. So Native American leader, he leads a rebellion against the newly British occupiers, including capturing Fort Detroit, which was one of those sites of violence. You have other episodes of violence like the Paxton Boys. These are European immigrants who were notorious for a massacre 
of Native Americans, including men, women, and children. So when we combine these things together, on top of the fact that you did have the British handing out diseased blankets. So if you've ever heard of instances where, uh, you know, there was the intentional trying to spread of disease, it was during this period in Pontiac's rebellion that that occurred. And so when we look at the culmination of, you know, this rebellion led by Pontiac, a Native American leader, the, the violence, demonstrated by the Paxton boys to simply just destroy one another at all costs with the use of things like disease blankets. This is a huge uptick in violence on the frontier. And this was something that was not necessarily desired by the British. And so the solution to this problem is the proclamation line of 1763. What it seeks to do is to stop violence between colonists and Native Americans, right? That's the purpose. It seeks to stop the violence between colonists and Native Americans. And what it does is that it builds, or it doesn't build, but it creates, and we'll use green here, it creates a barrier between the lands that belong to the colonists and the lands that belong to Native Americans. So the British essentially set this aside as Indian territory and this as colonial. There we go, colonial territory. And that's the way that the British are essentially going to solve this problem is simply by separating the two sides, right? So we could put separation as what they're seeking to do. Now, interestingly enough, when this line is put down, it's essentially the British who are enforcing it on the colonists, right? It's the colonists who are essentially the problem here. They're encroaching onto Indian territory. And so this also begins to build resentment, right? And uh, resentment against where the colonists can or cannot live. Uh, we'll talk about the building up of resentment all throughout this chapter. Now that's not to mention what the original problem is, and, and this probably is the biggest issue left over from the Seven Years' War, and that is the national debt. The national debt is doubled. The question is, who is responsible for paying that debt? Should the colonists pay for it, right? That's the question. Now, not everybody agrees on that. Obviously, the colonists don't believe that they should pay for it or they shouldn't pay that much for it. However, George Grenville is appointed to be the prime minister in the aftermath of the Seven Years' War, and he definitely believes the colonists should pay for it, right? So he is going to enact a set of policies or rules that places this debt burden on the colonists. After all, it was the colonists who benefited the most from this. It was the British soldiers from England coming over, defeating the French, and essentially saving their lives. So of course, the colonists ought to pay for that. And so some of the laws that Grenville begins to place on the colonies or, or various reforms that England begins to pass on the colonies include the Currency Act, which says that all taxes must be paid in silver. In other words, what the colonies would do is they would print their own money. So what they're saying is no paper money. Because if you're Great Britain, you obviously want to get paid back in something that's worth something, not just paper. So the Currency Act says everything must be paid back in silver. Obviously, the colonists don't like this very much. Uh, the Sugar Act is a crackdown on smuggling. And this is going to bring us back to a term that we covered some chapters back, and that was the Navigation Acts. And the Navigation Acts had put pretty strict rules on the colonists for who they could and could not trade with. However, the colonists ignored them and there was a lot of smuggling going on. And really what the Sugar Act seeks to do is to crack down on a lot of that illegal trade that was occurring. One of the, one of the ways the Sugar Act was enforced was through vice admiralty courts. These were naval courts. So if you were caught smuggling, you would be put before a naval court and the key here was that there was no jury. And so this really rubbed the colonists the wrong way uh, because they didn't believe that it was, or they believed that it was against their rights as Englishmen, that a uh, right to a fair trial was certainly something they deserved. And in these vice admiralty courts, if you got caught smuggling, you were essentially gonna be found guilty no matter what. So again, kind of all of these little things are building up and uh, the colonists are, are growing more and more in terms of resentment. 
Now the Sugar Act itself was an indirect tax, meaning that it only taxed things that were imported slash exported. And for the most part, the colonists were okay with this, right? Because the colonists believed that anything inside the colonies, they had the right to tax that. But as soon as you sent it overseas, as soon as it left the land of that colony into the water, the colonists more or less, not everyone, but more or less recognized that that was okay. Parliament had the right to rule the ocean. But it brought up this question about representation because both of these laws, the Currency Act and the Sugar Act, uh, the colonists had no say in either of these matters. And so colonists begin, began to question this really, right? Should the colonists have a say uh, in terms of where they decide to put that proclamation line, what kind of currency they could use, uh, and what should be the laws when it comes to things like uh, you know, sugar importing and exporting.